My mother is the very pragmatic Depression era vegetable gardener who is a gardener of efficiency. Um, every inch of space is used to, to produce, you know, to take care of the family. My garden is, is, is sheer useless beauty. All I want are flowers, 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 flowers. I want to look out my window and see indefensible amounts of beauty for no reason whatsoever. Indefensible, indefensible am amounts of beauty. <laughs> I must say, one of the things that surprised me most about the conversation I had with you recently was I invited you to come to a literary festival, which was, I thought, something you simply couldn't refuse. And very elegantly and extremely firmly, you declined. <laughs> Elegance is always firm, Paul. Uh, now, you, you, de you, declined. I declined. you declined strongly, and I imagined you would. Why? Did you imagine I would, or did you think, I did imagine, what did you think your odds were when you I, invited I, me? I thought I would fail, but I don't mind failing. I'm actually yeah. quite interested in yeah. the notion of failure. Well, I declined and needed to decline because, as I had explained to you, as much as I would love to go to Spain, <laughs> and hang out with you and do this festival. I, I had to. Um, I was compelled to. I, I am, at this moment in my life, my own bodyguard. Um, that's, that's one way that I think of it. And I am the bodyguard of the biggest homework assignment of my entire life, which is this new novel that I'm working on. And everything else has to be defended against. And, and I think it's so interesting because it seems obvious that there comes a period in your life where you have to learn how to say no to things that you don't want to do. But I think the biggest, trickiest lesson in, in holding on to the stalwart commitment to your creativity is learning how to say no to things you do want to do, including going to Spain, you know? Um, learning how to, how to answer the question, what are you willing to give up in order to have what you really, really want? Um, and what I really, really want right now is to defend the space that I need to do the book that I'm doing. This crossroads you're describing now must have existed for you before. There must have been other moments where you were the bodyguard of your work. Yeah. And there were other moments when you said no, but there are other moments when you said yes. Yeah. And I'd like you to describe <laughs> the yes and no's of your past. Ooh, or at least some of them. Um, well, okay, I'll give you probably the, the biggest, earliest example was that I said no to getting an education in creative writing, which is a thing you can do now, right? Um, it was never a thing that people did more than six decades ago. Uh, it didn't exist. You became a writer by reading your master's work, which was available to you wherever literacy was available, wherever books were, and by working and by writing. And there was never a history in writing of tutorialship in the same way that there was a long history in European culture of tutorialship in art, in, in the visual arts, in dance, and you'd go Men to a musical conservatory, you would study under an art, yeah. uh, uh, the studio of a master, you'd be in Caravaggio's, you, know, you would work under somebody. There's no history of that in writing. There's no example of that in writing. This, by its definition, something that you have to do yourself, and then suddenly in post-war America, we invented this thing called the master's degree in, in creative writing, and it was available to me. And actually, even as an undergraduate in college, it was available to me to, to focus on studying writing. And the biggest no, the biggest first no that I said as an aspiring writer was no to that. Why? Um, because I didn't buy it. <laughs> I didn't buy it, and I thought, uh, first of all, I, I can't see how it's going to benefit me to go $60,000 into debt to come out with a master's degree in creative writing. It's not like going into debt to go to medical school and you know that you're going to come out and have some sort of a booming career. You know, to saddle yourself with that kind of, you know, financial anchor at such a young age just seemed like it would be the death of creativity. And secondly, I just thought, as a young writer trying to find my voice, the very worst place I can be is in a room with a bunch of other young writers trying to find their voices. And I took like two creative writing classes when I was in college to see, to confirm it. And as a young writer... And I was with, sure that I was And right. as a young writer, where would the best place be? Anywhere else. <laughs> anywhere else <laughs> anywhere but, but a classroom. Yeah. Anywhere else. Mark Halpern said that once in an essay. He said, join the army, wash dishes, work on a riverboat, 
you know, volunteer to dig ditches at a, at a kibbutz, do anything but go to a creative writing school. And you know, when I say this, I, I've become actually less fascistic about this over the years than I was when I was younger. I was really adamant about that. And I've softened on it only because some writers who I really admire came out I, of those programs. I was about to ask you. My friend Ann Patchett came right. out of the Iowa Writers Workshop, um, and clearly it did not harm her as a writer to go there. It probably helped her a great deal. Um, Has she spoken to you about that? She, you know what? Weirdly, not. Um, and that is a question I should bring up with her. You, you, you should, I because there is to. a. Um, our listeners should know that yeah. you have this extraordinary. I mean, it's really extraordinary friendship with Anne Patchett, because as I understand it, yeah. you have met. But the main place you meet is through the distance, the uh, extraordinary, exquisite distance, of. Um, of a sideway glance that a letter offers you. You yeah. write letters to each other, which yeah. in our day it's and an age is quite, no, it's a, it's a quite extraordinary yeah. friendship. Yeah, and it was very much decided, um, and I, you know, it was decided mutually and silently that that's what we would do. We met uh, on the panel of, of some discussion about writing. We fell in love at first sight. Actually, I fell in love with her as soon as I heard her speak. She's this tiny petite, fragile, sort of delicate looking, respectable woman who gets up and sort of Moses comes out of her mouth. She just has this extraordinary power of voice, not only on the page, but, but in reality. And I was awed. And, and we t exchanged addresses and our letters arrived the same day in the mail. We each wrote the other a letter. We exchanged phone numbers, we exchanged emails, we exchanged mailing addresses, and somehow our instinct knew that this was meant to be a letter writing relationship and it has been now for I think five or six years. But I haven't asked her about graduate school. Oh. What would you ask her? Uh, I think I would ask her if she would think that she could have done it without it um, and, and what her purpose was going and how, what her certainty was because she's also a very certain person. Um, her divining rod somehow told her that that was the path that she needed to take just as solidly as my divining rod said <laughs> but your, divi your divining Absolutely rod is not. no less certain. Yeah, it, it you was don't clear. feel. You, do you feel ambivalent and regretful of about having said no? About going to graduate yeah. school? No, 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 no. Absolutely. So not. this is not a no way, yeah. like the no saying no to me now. Yeah. Um, to come and enjoy a wonderful literary festival. That you know the, I'm crying in my sleep regretting. I, well, I, 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 I am, and I'm, I, even on this program now, I'm trying to taunt you. You're still I'm trying still to get trying. me there. I'm still trying. You know, because as my father said, you know, I'm a nudnik. I'm, I'm just going to go again and again and again. But I admire the kind of really extreme discipline the, how do you call it in English, titu, when you are stubborn. Mm. There's something about Elizabeth Gilbert that is tremendously stubborn and will not give in. On to this only, that's the thing. In and why every this? every other aspect of my life, I am the biggest mush, I'm the biggest pushover, I'm, I, I have no boundaries, I overgive, I, overshare, I, 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 I can't deny, I can't see that somebody needs something and not make sure that they have it, regardless of the cost that it takes on me. It, the writing is different and it's always been different. It's been, um, it's a calling and it's devotional and it's, I was almost, weirdly, the word that was just going to come out was political. I don't even know why, because I, I don't think of myself as a political writer, what but you, it, I feel like mean? I'm marching around with a yeah. sign, um, you know, like on the barricade. You know, it's, it's forceful in that way. Um, it's insistent, and it's too important not to be. And I feel like if you're very lucky, maybe you get one thing in your life like that, and it will educate you then on how to behave in the rest of your life. And hopefully, as I'm getting older, the certainty and the, the discipline and the the reverence that I have for writing will sort of make me stronger in other ways too. But I want to get back to this notion of traveling yeah. and this notion of not accepting an invitation in right. order to become the, um, the person who takes a journey mm -hmm. with the book. Mm -hmm. 
off you go now, in a few weeks from now, to work on your work by being away. This is hardly the first time that you've done this. Right. <laughs> the book people know you most for, you yeah. Pray Love, is precisely a book that came about in some form or fashion because you had the good fortune of traveling and being able to write about it. What are you looking for on this particular trip? Which is another way for me to ask you, what are you writing? Where are you going? What are you writing? Yeah. Um, and will well, you come back? I, I will come back. Um, I definitely will come back uh, and, and write the book when I come back. Uh, this part that I'm going on now is part of the research of the book. Um, I think, you know, even as a fiction writer, I'm a really avid, I would even say geeky researcher. Um, you, you know, you know that I, I wrote my first two books at the New York Public Library and they were works of fiction, but I needed to be amid the research. I needed to be writing it in the stacks of books in order to find out what was missing from, from the body of knowledge I needed to, to write those books. Did you need the company of others? Uh, and I needed, yeah, the river of work, that feeling that everyone river knows. of work, that's Everyone beautiful. is yeah. silently doing their thing and if you interrupt it, you're going to interrupt the current of work, so you must also work. Um, it, it's a lovely, lovely feeling to be working quietly among other people who are also respecting their calling or or, or homeless and taking a, a snooze as yeah. it may be you know um, or trying to pick someone up whatever happens at the library but but in this Many case things. I'm I'm working on a book and it's about 19th century botanical exploration um, and I need to go where my character went um, and in 1845 my character goes to Tahiti uh, to work with a missionary who is also a botanical explorer and to solve a mystery in her own life. And um, so, I have to go to Tahiti. Otherwise, I would be remiss. <laughs> you know, you gotta go, because the character's going there, it's just required. Um, and she is born with the century in 1800, and, uh, and her journey through science sort of follows the, the, the 19th century journey through science. So she's, she's current with everything, the sort of evolution out of the, the deist enlightenment era into um, the, the, the Thoreauian transcendentalism, the beginnings of evolution, the divide between secular and religious. Her, her life spans that entire story. She's a scientist? She's a scientist. Do you know that the word scientist was not in existence until 1835? I did not. And it was voted on by the Royal Fellows in London and they decided what are we going to call this? Um, prior to that you were, it was called natural philosophy and or you were a man of science. But they didn't have a word to describe the person. Um, and, and they voted and there were people who adamantly voted against it saying it sounded too much like atheist. Um, which was already telling. Where did you find this out? Oh, I don't know. Um, I think I found it out at Kew Gardens in their botanical library, um, reading about Joseph Banks, um, uh, who's a character yes, in the book of course. as well. So, um, yeah. what you, you you need to follow your character. Yeah, and you know, I'll tell you. Yeah. If we have a minute, I'll tell you the irony of this. Um, this book did not begin as a novel. This book began as a memoir. And this book began as a memoir that I was going to write that was going to be about not traveling. And it was going to be about staying in my hometown while reading Captain Cook and reading about the great 19th, 18th and 19th century discoverers and the circumnavigators and, and, and about the way that these people threw themselves out into the world and examined every inch. You know, they brought ethnographers and botanists and they, they took water samples. I mean, they, they, they just devoured every place that they went. They and were how, armchair, armchair scientists. Yeah, and, and, and how the world has become so explored that, that perhaps the more interesting thing to do now is to stay in one place and learn that one place. And so I thought, I'm going to stay in my little town of Frenchtown, New Jersey. I'm going to explore it as closely as Cook explored the world. I'm going to learn every tree, every rock, every blade of grass, every history, every story, every house. And I'm going to write a book about not going somewhere. Um, and and then I started to research these great explorers and slowly this book transformed. And I thought, no, I don't want to do that, I don't want to do that, I want to write about these guys. And then I thought, no, I don't want to write nonfiction about these guys though, I want to write a novel. And suddenly this turned into this big global novel that's, that takes place in London, Amsterdam, Philadelphia and, and Tahiti. And then all of a sudden I had to go to all those places <laughs> and explore them. So even despite my best efforts, um, I'm doing another travel book um, that began as the exact opposite. Liz, what, what inspired you 
in writing this novel? I mean, how did this subject of botany and natural sciences inspire you? Where did it come from? I mean, where does this oh. passion emerge from? There's two things. The first is that once I bought a house and settled down and started a garden, my life started to change in a very funny way. Um, and, and so I'm interested in plants um, in a way that is both appallingly bizarre to me and totally inevitable. Appallingly bizarre because I ran away from my family's farm as soon as I could. <laughs> and my you, parents... Because you grew up I grew in, up on a Christmas tree yeah. farm. My mother is a master gardener. We lived out of our garden when we were growing up. My parents are, are um, oh God, I don't even have to where to begin, but, but, but essentially they're people of the earth. Um, they're, they're, they're dirt under the fingernails kind of people. And we, my sister and I, were, were pushed to be that. We had goats, we had chickens. Um, you know, I grew up doing this kind of stuff, and I never liked it. Um, I, I, I pushed against doing it. I wanted to go to New York City. I came to New York City. I saw the world. And then what do I do? I end up moving to a small town and starting a garden, and that returned to the dirt. My mother used to say that, that any day that goes by that you have not touched the soil, you are not alive. And, um, and, and returning to that and discovering that despite my best efforts to not learn anything about the dirt as a child, I actually know a lot about it because I did it the whole time I was growing up and it was sort of, it, it came into me despite me not wanting to do so it. Anyway, all of which is to say, now I'm really interested in plants. Um, but I'm interested in the plants in a different way than my about parents to say, were. I was about to say, it is and it isn't a return uh, yeah. to origins. It's a, uh, it's a hybrid, <laughs> you right. know, um, it's a grafting, you know, to use to, to take the analogy all the way, it's a root graft. I have some rootstock of my original family values, and now I'm grafting onto it something that I went out in the world, and I'm creating something else. And so, whereas my dad is the, the, the Christmas tree farmer and the forester, and my mother is the very pragmatic, Depression-era vegetable gardener who is a gardener of efficiency. Um, every inch of space is used to, to produce, you know, to take care of the family. My garden is... is, is sheer useless beauty. All I want are flowers, 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 flowers. I want to look out my window and see indefensible amounts of beauty for no reason whatsoever. Indefensible, indefensible I, I, amounts I of beauty. Tell me more you know, about that. Like, that is such an I don't, exquisite... It doesn't feed anybody. It doesn't make firewood. It's not pragmatic. It's, it's just um, in that same way that, that, that my friend Wade, who's a wonderful painter, always says where he feels the awe of God is when he looks at, at parts of nature and he says that is so unnecessarily beautiful. There's no reason that fish needs to be that rainbowic. There's no reason that, 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 that this plant has to be so explosively beautiful. It's too much, you know? It's and that's excessive. the kind of beauty, excessive, it's indulgent. It's not Yankee, it's not pragmatic. Um, it's, mag it's just absurd. It doesn't make for anything, except for it makes hummingbirds and butterflies and bees happy, and it makes me happy. And the other thing that I want is I want to know the academic background of those plants. I want to know where they came from. I want to know where in Persia those tulips were originally found. I want to know who found them. Why? Um, because I... What does it afford you? It, wonder, more wonder, um, more wonder that, that I have growing right next to each other, um, a native New Jersey bush that, that, that's called beautyberry that has these absurd like L'Oreal makeup color, bright purple flower, bee-like bee berries on it, right next to um, a rhododendron that was discovered in the Himalayas by a British explorer, you know, it, it, in my yard, you know, um, it's the history of travel, it's the history of, you know, the Dutch women who came over to the New World and in the pockets of their skirts they had bulbs of, of daffodils that they came and planted here and now I have those too and, and, and I've been to Holland and seen where they come from and I, I just like the big story of it. So somehow it felt like the only thing I could write right now is a story about travel, exploration, collection and botany. I got a place to go in the morning I got a place to go